Now I'm going to go to an interview that I did just a, a few minutes ago with the Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, and really what I wanted to ask him about was this very important new bill that he is launching, an online harms bill announced in the Queen's speech. And I started by asking him who exactly would decide on the basis of this new law what kind of stuff on Twitter and Facebook is so toxic that it has to be removed. Well, there are three really important principles with this bill. First of all, as you say, protecting children online from harms. Secondly, protecting people from illegal harm. So basically, what's currently illegal on the street should be strictly enforced online as well, and social media companies have to do that. But thirdly, also protecting our precious freedoms of expression and the right to open debate and so on. And the, in terms of who actually makes the decisions, mm -hmm. then that will be requiring social media companies to have properly enforceable terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. If they fail to do that, if they don't have proper mechanisms for cracking down on uh, illegal content, uh, if they don't properly protect children, then they can face fines of up to 10% of their global revenue, and that will be enforced by Ofcom, the regulator. And, and, and just to be clear, though, you've explicitly talked about offences language that isn't illegal but is nonetheless damaging. How do you decide what that is? Well, I think the, the basic principle I think most people get, and I was at Charlton, the football mm. club, um, just uh, earlier this week, there's a world of difference between robustly and aggressively having an argument with someone about a player's skill, for example, but then that moving into bring into the colour of their skin, so turning it into a, a racist um, abuse. We wouldn't accept that in wider society and we shouldn't accept it online. And what we're saying to the social media companies is you've got to have ways of cracking down on this. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to face very big fines. But, I mean, interestingly, the footballers that we've spoken to about this particular issue have said to us what they wanted to see was simply a requirement on the social media companies to ban anonymous accounts so that when somebody says something like that, you can, in a sense, identify them and remove them. Why haven't you addressed this issue of anonymity online? Well, it, it is uh, already the case that the police can follow up and uh, remove uh, anonymity. They have those, those tools in place. Actually, from the conversations I have with many footballers, they just want social media companies to be held to account. And this is precisely what this legislation is doing. It is saying that if you don't take action, then an independent regulator can fine you up to 10% of your global revenue. Now, if you think of a firm like Facebook, that is a huge incentive for them to Don't up their it's, game. It's, it's plainly billions. But then you've mentioned Facebook. Facebook banned Trump for life for things that he said online. Did the things that he said online constitute the kind of online harm that you would expect a Facebook to remove? Well, I think as a, a UK government minister, you'd expect me not to get into the details of what the former US president did, but the principle of what we're doing, and this is the first time we're doing it, is we are saying... Would you that... applaud Facebook for taking that action? Well, what I think all social media companies need to do is they need to have some transparency mm -hmm. about how to do this. They can't be arbitrarily removing content. And it's a basic principle for me that things like that that infringe our freedom of expression, freedom of debate, should be decided by ministers accountable to the people, not by executives on the west coast of America accountable to their shareholders. So for the first time we're saying they have to, for example, have a right of appeal rapidly so that if you have content removed, you can challenge it. Right. And if you fail to do that, you face so under your rules, So under your rules, Donald Trump could appeal? Uh, in, in simple terms, somebody could appeal having their, um, their material removed. And the reason why we're doing that mm. is because it's absolutely essential that we put duties on social media companies mm. to uphold principles of freedom of expression and democratic debate. What I really don't want this legislation to do mm. is stifle the ability to have robust open debate with woke campaigners, whoever else, stopping it from happening. But I do want them to crack down on the kind of a racism, misogyny that we see online and equally to make sure our children are properly protected. OK, now look... Um, this is a tricky area, and, you know, be absolutely clear, this is not a gotcha question, it's a serious question. Um, if, for argument's sake, somebody on Twitter or Facebook referred to gay men as tank-topped bumboys or uh, to black people as piccaninnies with watermelon smiles, I think most people would say there was a duty on those social media companies to remove that content. But that was content 
that was written by the Prime Minister in an earlier incarnation as a newspaper writer. So you can see the difficulty. Well, look, all of these issues came up uh, during the leadership No, no, I'm not... I'm not no, no, hang on a second. I'm not, this is not election. a criticism of the Prime Minister. It is simply saying that what, to some people, is colourful language in a newspaper article is to other people offensive, and drawing that line is extraordinarily difficult. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that that is uh, actually the, the case. And this is precisely because I want to ensure robust freedom of expression and freedom of debate that we are putting in place for the first time ever requirements on social media companies to take into account... But are you saying that expression. social media shouldn't remove content like that? Because I do... I, mean, I think this is a genuine... People want to know what you think. Yes, yeah, well... It, First of all, it's not what I think as a minister, and this is a really important principle. It is for social media companies to make sure they have transparent rules, transparent terms and conditions, and they enforce them, that they take seriously abuse. And I have to say, Joe, there is a world of difference between uh, robust debate and the kind of vile racism that uh, football players have talked to me on several occasions about. And I think there is a real appetite no, no, after I get that, but I think like... most, news, most footballers would not like the use of the term piccaninnies with watermelon smiles. They would just say that was completely wrong. I think most people can tell the difference between the sort of vile racist abuse that is going on unchecked at the moment... Yeah and uh, robust and open to... As I say, all I was trying to do is highlight how difficult these judgments are. And there's another aspect of it which I think is difficult, which is you, as I understand it, are excluding broadcasters and newspapers and their online sites from these regulations. And yet all of these organisations, including ours... Actually, I don't think ours does have a comment section, but most newspapers have comment sections. And in those comment sections, there is often really horrible stuff left by readers. Why is that exempt? Well, I think most... Um newspapers have some kind of uh, moderation policy for them. But that, again, this goes to the balance. What I'm trying to do is make sure we have freedom of expression, freedom of debate. I don't want to stifle that. But at the same time, I want to, to crack down these very active campaigns. It's interesting. I was uh, meeting with some, uh, uh, some sort of uh, companies that, that look at how you crack down on this. It's often a very small number of aggressively... Um, racist trolls that are pushing the sort of agenda and that they were pushing on the terraces in the 90s. We crack down on that. That kind of racism is tolerated far, far less and rightly. That same change has not happened online. And I think there's a real moment after things like the great fan reaction to stopping the European Super League to come together in order to address this. And I see real appetite for doing so. As you know, the science academic Sarah Dry at the Science Museum says you effectively cancelled her by, you know, making her position on contested heritage incompatible. She says you, you're the person who's breached impartiality. Well, what we have always said for public bodies is that they have to abide by certain government policies. For example, it's always been the case that trustees should promote diversity in their organisations. It happened under Labour governments, it happened under this government. It is equally the case that we have a clear government policy which is that uh, major institutions are the temporary custodians of our national heritage. It is, I think most of your viewers would think, the first thing they want institutions to do is to protect that. And all we are saying is that trustees should be committed to protecting that heritage. But why is a debate about it? objects that some people find really offensive, why is that not an acceptable debate by a trustee? Because those institutions have been funded by the taxpayer, were set up to preserve heritage not to destroy and remove it. It's a basic principle for those organisations. And we say that, that that is why they are funded. But if you talk to somebody in Bolton or Burnley or wherever else, why are they paying through the taxes? It's not my money that's being used to fund them. It's their money, and they're funding it to make sure that those precious parts of our heritage are protected for future generations. Oliver Darden, many thanks. Thank you.